Today, we are uh, going to have um, several presentations, first by Dr. Ulad Belavuso, who is senior researcher at the Acer Institute and the former MELA project leader for the Dutch team, MELA GOES, and we'll get into this very soon for uh, uh, the project on memory laws in European and comparative perspective. Uh, so it's in this framework um, that, that this event was organized. Then we'll move on to a presentation from Dr. Grajina uh, Baranowska, uh, who is um, assistant uh, professor at the Institute of Law Studies uh, of the Polish Academy of Sciences and former MELA postdoc researcher. We have a lot of MELA members uh, in the panel today for our greatest, greatest pleasure. Then Ms. Uh, Catherine Bomberger uh, will um, also give a presentation she is Director General of the International Commission on Missing Persons. Um, then Dr. Leon Castellanos Jankiewicz will give a presentation. He's also a researcher at the Acer Institute and also former MELA postdoc uh, researcher. Finally, we'll have a presentation um, by Mr. Bernard de, de Hem. Uh, sorry if I mispronounced the name. Uh, he is a member of the, the UN Working Group on Enforced or Involuntary Disappearances since 2013. And then uh, a discussion will be led uh, by Dr. Alexandra Glitschinska, uh, who is um, uh, Grabies, uh, 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 sorry, uh, Alexandra Glitschinska Grabies. And again, uh, I'm sure I mispronounced the name and, and apologies for that. Uh, she is assistant professor as well as at the Institute of Law Studies um, of the Polish Academy of Sciences and also former MELA project leader for the Polish team. So she will uh, act as a discussant on the basis of all the presentations that will have been given and will then also take your, your questions. We'll move on to a Q&A session. Uh, so without further ado, I want to give the floor to my colleague, colleague Ulad, uh, who will tell you about the MELA Declaration in Law and Historical Memory towards the Constitutionalization of Memory Politics. Thank you very much. All right, I have two questions immediately, Rebecca. Uh, do you hear me first one? And do you see on the screen the shared uh, web page of the MELA project? We can perfectly hear you and we, we see perfectly your, your shared screen. Uh, so thanks a lot in that case, uh, Rebecca, also for the nice introduction. From my side, I would also like to start with uh, thanking the UN Working Group on Enforced Involuntary Disappearances. It was a wonderful uh, cooperation with you that made this event uh, possible, albeit online in this uh, in this uh, strange times we are living, the year 2020. Uh, and my special thanks are to a colleague of mine at the Asia Institute and within the MELA project to Leon Castellanos Jankiewicz because he is the true co-organizer from our side, the absolute soul and heart of uh, this project including the in, in kind of launching the cooperation with our Geneva partners. Well, as sad as it is that we cannot be all in uh, Geneva at that time due to the obvious reasons connected to the pandemics, uh, there is also a beneficial side of the story uh, that perhaps we could involve more uh, participants albeit on a passive uh, bench observing and chatting with us uh, today, of which we're extremely happy, so taking advantage of the, uh, of, of the current technologies. Uh, in my today's presentation, the accent will be on the MELA Declaration on Law and Historical Memory, also highlighting the whole subject of uh, memory loss and what we've done in the, uh, in the MELA project. So perhaps I will start with the MELA project uh, itself. So uh, MELA, uh, um, which sounds uh, as, as, as an apple to many uh, speakers of the Roman languages, uh, Miela, Mela uh, in Italian and Spanish, etc. In fact, it's the abbreviation of the, of, of the whole title, Memory Loss in European Comparative Perspective. Uh, it was a consortium project uh, run from 2016 until 2019 uh, in, cooperation, in the cooperation of four uh, universities. Uh, the head of the consortium uh, is Eric Heinz, based in the Queen uh, Mary 
Emory University. Uh, then there was the ASA Institute, of course. Uh, so both me and Leon are representatives of that project from the Dutch side then. Uh, we, today we also have on board the representative of the uh, of our Polish partners, the Polish uh, Academy of Sciences, uh, both Aleksandra Gliszczynska Grabes and uh, Grażyna Baranowska present and present, well, Grażyna is presenting Alexandra is participating as a discussant today. Uh, the consortium also included the Italian team at Bologna, led by a Professor Emanuela uh, Fronza. Uh, well, the project was supported by a program called HERA. It's an abbreviation of the Humanities in the European Research Area. This is a new EU uh, agency, so, agency. So there was a, a grant that we received in 2016 in the support of the um, of our activities. So the main derivables of um, of the project are actually very visible in our website. Therefore, wanted to connect instead of the PowerPoint uh, tonight with the uh, with the actual website of the project. So you you could check uh, various items of our activities on the uh, section of the news. Uh, you could see uh, the multiple publications delivered during this uh, project. You could see uh, the blog items and media appearances by various members of uh, of our consortium. Most importantly, I would say, in addition to the publications and participations in the conferences worldwide, so disseminating the results of our research, the uh, project accomplished in um, in, in, in two foundations. So the first one is the uh, legal database of memory loss and uh, policies covering practically all the EU countries. So we try to summarize um, and put in, in into our subfolders the uh, the major memory loss, both statutory and judicial decisions in uh, in in the number of EU and actually a considerable number of the non EU countries, as you will see. We also have this international dimensions trying to, to classify the, the relevant documents and case law from the Council of Europe, European Commission of Human Rights, European Court of Human Rights, European Union, United Nations, uh, broadly, or United Nations Human Rights Committee. Um, and we tried kind of to look into them through the classification of either soft remembrance laws or criminal offenses. Uh, the second major deliverable, practical deliverable, I would say, beyond uh, publications and normal academic activities like conferences and workshop organizations is the Mela Declaration in itself. So the summary of good practices developed in cooperation by our partners looking into how states are dealing with the right to truth and legal governance of memory on various levels and trying to distill what are the best practices that do not contradict uh, or contradict to the minimum to or conflict to the minimum with fundamental rights such as freedom of expression, uh, freedom of association, um, and more specifically freedom of uh, academic research, uh, how they have repercussions on minorities and protection of non-discrimination, protection of the dignity of the victims, uh, the survivors, and uh, their offspring even sometimes. So I'll, I'll say a few words about the Miller Declaration itself later during the presentation. And for now, perhaps I will concentrate on what our memory loss, since this is kind of the foundation of uh, our discussion today, memory loss in relation to the uh, enforced uh, disappearances in particular, of which my colleagues will be presenting today. So what are those uh, memory loss? By memory loss, we understood broadly within the project various mode of legal governance of historical memory, uh, both punitive and unpunitive. So the most emblematic of those are, of course, the prohibitions of genocide denial, in particular Holocaust denialism, perhaps those statutory, statutory laws or provisions criminalizing the uh, negation uh, or denial or trivialization of, uh, of the Holocaust or other types of uh, genocide is perhaps par excellence the most uh, known memory, memory type of memory law existing. Uh, but it's not exclusionary. Memory, lots of memory laws uh, surround us in, in their soft forms, in, in, in forms of municipality decisions, various administrative acts. Uh, sometimes they're elevated to the constitutional law, uh, about which I'll also dwell a little bit later. Um, such as, for example, the way the uh, ministries of education are regulating the school curriculum, how to teach history. The ways we are naming or renaming streets 
especially in the period of transition or decolonization, in honor of some historical persons that usually bring such a heated discussion in the societies. Um, well, so basically, all these clusters of very often soft uh, laws, including the various remembrance uh, practices, let's say the installation of the days, proclamation of the days of commemoration of certain events, events or glorification of certain historical figures. This is not necessarily a punitive uh, measure in itself. Very often it's even regarded rather this type of politics of memory than, um, than in, terms, in, in terms of usual law, right? So we've been looking broadly into all those um, aspects of uh, memory laws, both punitive and non-punitive, coming up with plenty of um, classifications. And one of the classifications that um, we found particularly helpful is looking into the dyna dynamics and the genesis of memory loss and their subsequent uh, development. And what we've discovered that the genesis of classy memory loss, as, as we know them, um, Today, date back to the, uh, uh, of course, we can talk about memory loss from deep antiquity of Greece or the French Revolution and the way, let's say, the, uh, the Republicans after the French Revolution imposed the archives or changed the calendar or made Louvre from a private collection to be a public museum, right? But most recently, uh, perhaps uh, the heart of uh, this legislation and its spillover lies in the prohibition of the Holocaust denialism in particular in Germany, Austria, then it spread gradually to the rest of the uh, of the continent. Uh, in parallel, even in, in, in a year earlier than Germany, the Israeli Knesset was adopting um, a law also prohibiting, criminalizing, in fact, the uh, Holocaust denialism, which is understandable in those uh, settings. So Holocaust denialism per se, perhaps lies in the heart of this um, tendency, uh, especially panel tendency, to look into historical regulation as the domain of the possible sort of legitimate interference of the state for the protection of the dignity of the victims and the uh, memory of the um, atrocities, as well as the imposition of the certain right to truth, which is in itself an extremely uh, contested uh, terminology and rather uh, recent terminology. So back then in the 90s, the Holocaust denial laws were viewed as just new criminal know-how as the uh, continuation of the hate speech laws uh, on the continent known as usually some incitement of hatred or propaganda of hatred in Germany and in France. So Germany uh, with its um, um, Strassgesetz, with its criminal court, Loi Guisson in, in France, uh, all set up this example for criminalizing the uh, denial, negationism or trivialization, banalization of the, um, of the Holocaust. But then the question uh, emerges, of course, if, if it's, it is for the Holocaust permissible and it's not entirely contradictory to freedom of speech. In certain settings, how about, how about other atrocities, multiple atrocities in the history of humanity or other types of genocide? Uh, let's say, how about Armenian genocide uh, denialism? Should it also be prohibited? And uh, in the 90s, if we're looking into these standards of criminalizing Holocaust denialism, we would see that it was rather um, a dignitarian sort of perspective on, on, on memory loss adopted by member state, which the head of the research consortium, Eric Heinz, once uh, prophetically called the uh, self inculpatory type of memory loss, by which we understand a type of a memory law where the state acknowledges the guilt for the past atrocities, taking it on the on account of the majority of the state, on the account of the title of nation, so to say. Let's say Germans are saying that, yes, we, the Germans, uh, perpetrated the terrible atrocities and basically destroyed the six, mi six million of uh, uh, European Jews. Mm, in this way, we kind of see this dignitarian way of of self-inculpating, self-acknowledging the, the guilt for the uh, past atrocities. Yet from the 2000s, we observe a completely different tendency, in particular in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, where we see a competition for 
rather uh, kind of non-accepting the guilt by virtue of memory loss and by rather delegating that guilt to other ethnic uh, or political groups, uh, in particular in the settings of uh, the Nazi and uh, communism. So we see the phenomenon which we called in the opposition to towards the self cultural and cultural loss, the uh, self exculptory loss. So that is the states uh, promulgating uh, legal provisions that particularly annihilate the state from the guilt, from the acknowledgement of the guilt for for the past, past atrocities. Let's say uh, some post-communist state of Central and Eastern Europe suggesting that we absolutely don't bear any guilt for the atrocities committed by the uh, by the uh, occupation powers of the Soviet uh, regime or the Nazi regime, or even in the countries uh, where it is, was evident that a significant part of the population had, or in an non-significant, it doesn't matter, but some part of the population had collaborated with the Nazis, for example, for the persecution of Jews, the state explicitly says, no, the nation as a whole is um, doesn't bear any guilt for this, um, therefore putting the guilt only on the foreign power, in that case, on the Germans. So that was particularly remarkable for, for the countries like uh, Poland, Hungary, Ukraine, as to a certain degree Russia, though it was a somewhat reverse uh, process, non acknowledging the guilt for the Soviet uh, crimes instead of uh, so it's completely contrary to what Poland, Poland Lithuania, uh, Hungary, etc. tried to, to impose. And um, Russia also can be seen as this agent of uh, kind of stirring up the so-called memory wars by virtue of memory loss uh, and the whole scholarship or the, the recent scholarship uh, of memory policy has been very much concentrated on those memory wars by virtue of memory loss. Here I'm talking about the contribution of such wonderful scholars as Nikolai Kopas, of Maria Malkso, etc. The states looking into the found ontological foundations of their identity as imposed through through uh, through memory loss. So we observe the self exculptory memory, memory loss being used as the way to alienate, uh, alienate the guilt. So let's say Poland with its famous so-called uh, Holocaust law, though, as uh, we've indicated in many publications, in particular with Alexander Glyszczynski and Anna Vucic, it's not really the Holocaust uh, law, uh, kind of delegated the whole guilt for the atrocities towards uh, Jews for, to, to the Nazi Germany, yeah, saying that the Poles, otherwise um, any attribution of the guilt to the Poles and the Polish nation should be criminalized. Uh, well, although the law in itself, uh, after the dis yeah, after the reform and the decisions of the constitutional tribunal in Poland is, is sort of inactive, is this dormant monster, it kind of gives an idea of what's, uh, what's going on. Also, the massive decommunization and the fight with monuments and street renaming has been um, elevated to this level of uh, ontological security. Therefore, we uh, are talking in this context about the rising phenomenon of the so-called mnemonic constitutionalism in Central and Eastern Europe, with some countries like Hungary, for example, even adopting a completely new constitutional project in 2011, which is very much historicized, starting from this, its preamble and leading through several articles, uh, kind of portraying Hungarian uh, history from the medieval, um, succession of the Hungarian constitutional history from the medieval times. And again, delegating the guilt for all the atrocities and misfortunes either to all the occupational uh, regimes, kind of promoting this very strong historic narrative. Russia recently, and the referendum of June, July 2020, uh, masqueraded kind of the, the new reform of the constitution to allow Putin to remain in power for, for many terms, with several uh, amendments, also including this uh, imposition of the historical uh, provision that delegates the, uh, uh, that, that kind of says that it's impossible to to accuse uh, Soviet Russia of uh, of the atrocities during World War II, or as in the Russian historiography, they insist calling it Great Patriotic War, uh, not acknowledging the guilt of the Soviet Union for the start of the war in 1939 and starting the count of the war instead from 1941. But it's not necessarily that the states are changing the constitution, right, like in Russian case, amending it or imposing a new constitutional project like in Hungary. 
Uh, countries like Poland to Ukraine, which are putting this memory legislation to the far front of their constitutional battles, sometimes uh, using for, for its adoption either the instruments uh, or the statutes of the of, of the institutions that were created with quasi-parliamentary powers, like the Institute of Historical Remembrance in Poland, just to uh, deal with the uh, historical memory, this process all shows this elevation of uh, memory politics from just memory loss or, um, or accident or like ad hoc uh, punitive memory loss like Holocaust denialism, Armenian genocide denialism into this level of memory politics that we call that that takes this constitutional level yeah this ontological level of this identitarian level which we discuss under the heading of uh, mnemonic constitutional constitutions now getting to the declaration why this uh the separation, the classification, distinction between self-inculpatory and self-exculpatory laws matters in, in the document that we've delivered summarizing those best practices. It was obviously very hard to agree whether it's a good thing that uh, Holocaust denialism is prohibited or is criminally prohibited with tr criminal measures or uh, it's actually contradictory to freedom of expression in itself. Uh, so there were divergent views even within the uh, Mela teams, but we've kind of delivered this, this very important distinction between self inculpatory self exculpatory laws uh without taking an, a very strong position on the holocaust denialism as itself and the criminal measures uh suggesting that of course there should be a considerable difference between looking into laws that are in in which by virtue of which the states are taking the guilt on the majority and the states that are delegating uh the guilt for the convenience of this political populism and demag de demagogical rhetoric of 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 the moment if you look at the, at the web page of the mela project you see both the mela declaration and the document accompanying it view the the accompanying explanatory comments and for those interested specifically in this document that we kind of try to disseminate amongst uh, European organizations, international organizations. So that's one of the reasons we wanted to organize the session with the UN Working Group. Uh, you will also, you could find particularly helpful, I would say, even not the only the text of the declaration itself, but also the explanatory uh, comments. Just briefly going into the structure of the declaration, it includes the uh, the usual preamble, as it's said, and six principles distilled. I would say the most important of which are as follows. Principle two suggests that freedoms of individuals and organizations to criticize past atrocities of policies of governing entities remain fundamental under internationally recognized rights of freedom of speech. And in this respect, uh, it is important that we, we were basing our uh, research and summaries and good practices also using the certain UN documents, including the reports of the Office of uh, the United Nations High Commission of Human Rights on the Right to Truth, uh, various UN Human Rights Council uh, resolution. Um, particularly in this project, I was responsible for, for EU law and for, for Council of Europe law, so for European dimensions. I'm, I'm, by training, I'm not exactly public international lawyer, so in, in my case, I was looking into various uh, soft law documents of the of the Council of Europe, into the UN Council decision 2008 uh, about xenophobic speech, which amongst other criminalizes also genocide denialism, trying to assess whether those are good practices or not. Another principle that is impossible and uh, that is important and distilled in this context is principle two, the right to scrutinize and criticize past atrocities of, or policies of governing entities shall be uh, guaranteed irrespective of the citizenship, residence, or location of any individual exercising the right. N Principle four suggests that uh, governing entities should not introduce laws or policies to penalize acts of defamation or offense against the state or against any past or present governing body or official, in particular where such acts are construed to encompass accusations that such entities or officials perpetrated, contributed, or failed to prevent violations of international uh, rights and law, uh, international human rights law, excuse me, uh, by which we mean, of course, the protection of journalists and broadly historical and academics. Governing entities should not introduce laws or policies, policies to penalize acts of defamation or offense against the nation, in particular where such acts are construed to encompass accusations that such 
nation or population had perpetrated, contributed to, or failed to prevent violations of international human rights, because we see that very often those self exculpatory memory laws are designed as sort of a prohibition of the group defamation, in that case, defamation of the nation. So let's say the Polish nation, in that case, for the law I mentioned in the Polish context, is immune towards the atrocities against uh, its uh, Jewish population. It's obviously untrue. And then prosecuting under this pretext, uh, historians or journalists suggesting otherwise is obviously contradictory to the uh, human rights standards. Governing entities should prohibit this similar uh, contact we say also including but not limiting limited to paramilitary groups seeking to silence by coercive or threats individuals or organizations who accuse any past or present governing entity uh, of, or officials of having perpetrated contrib contributed to or failed to prevent violations of international human rights which is perhaps the most relevant context of our today discussion on enforced uh, disappearances uh, well, and finally, academic researchers and human rights defenders must enjoy the freedom to investigate and report fully and publicly. Again, it all looks very de declaratory and even somewhat trivial unless you look into the accompanying document of uh, what we mean by, um, by this principle. It's also the absolute minimum of best recommendations that we uh, find helpful as the result of our analytical work. Uh, as we recommend for international European or other regional organizations for, for the adoption. Uh, since our discussion today is largely about memory loss, but in the context of enforced uh, disappearances, again, I just wanted to highlight in my presentation without touching on enforced uh, disappearances, this is the subject for my follow-up colleagues, the importance of memory loss and policies in a way they, they shape those state-sponsored narratives that in itself a very problematic access because uh, states, whether for a good purpose or not, usually uh, doing this ideal, idyllic pictures, sterile pictures, where they self-portray the state machinery as immune to atrocities and only necessarily as uh, full of glory events, glory past and glor um, glorified uh, ancestors without acknowledging the, uh, the guilt, which is problematic both internally for the minorities, but also externally for the setup of the international organizations and uh, the dynamics of uh, international relations. So, I guess that's that's all I wanted to, to say. If there are more questions in the end of our discussion regarding the Mela project or memory loss more broadly, uh, irrespective of the context of um, enforced uh, disappearances uh, or the right to truth, I would be happy to, to answer those questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ulat, for this uh, for presenting this fascinating project. I think it will give uh, great grounds for, for discussion afterwards as well. Uh, I would like to invite now Dr. Gradzina Baranowska for her presentation on memory governance in the context of enforced disappearances. And I think it's worth uh, underlining that I think you have a book on families of disappeared persons that is coming soon. It can be also uh, food for, for thought and discussion afterwards. The, the floor is yours, Gradzina. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon. Do uh, uh, you hear me? Is everything okay? okay. It's, it's really an honor to, to be taking part in an event that is co-hosted by the Working Group on Enforcing Involuntary Disappearances and also with such distinguished panelists. Uh, and I'm also really happy that we have so many participants. I'm sure there will be great questions and discussions, so I will keep short to, to, to get to them. Yesterday, during the joint section, a session of the Working Group and the Committee on Enforced Disappearances, um, one of the invited guests was uh, Estara de Carlotto. Uh, she's the um, um, driving force between the grandmothers of the Plaza de, de Maya, which is the organization of the women that are looking for their grandchildren uh, disappeared during the Argentinian dictatorship. Uh, and she mentioned that the main goals that they were having can be uh, summarized in three words. And she said, truth, memory, and justice. So memory is at the very heart of approaching enforced disappearances. Um, this is also because when states uh, commit enforced disappearances, uh, the very goal is to eliminate the person from the family, from the community, and sometimes from politics as well. Um, because of that, the initiative of the families and communities is to bring the person back into public life, back into the family. Uh, so when we look into individual actions, we will see that at homes, 
uh, in, in communities. Uh, there will be art, uh, pictures brought up in public or names. Uh, very different actions in, in different con historical or uh, geographical contexts. However, as Ulaj said, what is kind of at the heart of the MEVA project are those initiatives that are driven by the state, that are um, registered by the state, that are somehow monitored by the state. So we are looking, we were looking at legislation, we were looking at adopted policies, apologies, statement made by public officials. And that is the part of uh, memorialization practices that I want to look into today. Um, and I will look at, as the title said, at memory governance and enforced disappearances. I will first very shortly talk about obligations and in particular how the working group approaches obligations in the context of memory governance. So those memory actions that are governed by the state um, and enforced disappearances, of course. And the second part. Uh, I will highlight flag uh, three challenges that arise specifically with regard to memory governance and enforced disappearances. So the obligation to, to memorize by the state can be somehow read even from the declaration from 1992. There's an obligation by state to provide redress both to the forcibly disappeared person and to his or her family. This has been further explained by the working group in the thematic uh, issue from 2012. And the working group um, um, specified that uh, this includes also reparation and those where appropriate also include satisfaction. In this thematic issue, the working group uh, mentions uh, what forms of satisfaction can be done by states. And of course, this is a list that is open to, to additions, but just to show you that there are really many ways that this, uh, this can be approached. Uh, some forms that have been mentioned are judicial decisions, official declarations, public apologies and public ceremonies. Uh, commemoration and tributes to victims. And here it's important to say that victims of enforced disappearances are not only uh, the disappeared persons, but also their families, as well as establishing memorials and monuments. And in, in the context of our MELA research, it's really very relevant that the working group stated that legislation should set out the criteria and process of establishment of such memorials. So there is a specific point uh, toward um, governance of the memory by the state. Um, the working group in another thematic issue mentioned that symbolic reparations are a crucial component of comprehensive reparation programs. So symbolic reparations is another name that we can use to that. Um, and while the scope is really wide and states can use different forms, when we look at reports of the working group to uh, after state visits, uh, we can see how they are specifically um, informed and how uh, the working group approaches them in specific uh, historical and geographical contexts. In, in particular, since 2016, most of the reports state, uh, after state visits contain a section that is co-devoted to memory. So it's really easy to follow how, how the working group approaches that. Also, the Committee on Enforced Disappearances has encouraged states to commemorate uh, enforced disappearances. However, it has not been as specific as the working group so far. So in that can, uh, to, to see what the scope can be, it's, it's actually really uh, useful to use the, the state reports of the working group. So now moving on to the challenges that I wanted to mention. I'm, I'm going to flag three challenges, which I think are very specific for memory governance of um, enforced disappearances. Uh, the first uh, one is connected to the fact that um, enforced disappearances cannot be equated to death. Uh, so when we are commemorating enforced disappearances, this needs to be done, uh, and here I can use the, the wording of the guiding principles from the Committee on Enforced Disappearances, uh, should be conducted under the presumption that a forcibly disappeared person is alive. And uh, that needs to be um, approached when uh, des designing monuments, when writing on those monuments, when designing apologies and statements. So those need to be very carefully designed in a way to um, include that m many or most of the families will consider their loved disappeared one still to be alive. Um, and it excludes or makes it really controversial uh, to take such effort at cemeteries. 
Um, so this, these are efforts which really need to be closely considered by states when, when adopting that. And uh, of course, an exception of that would be a situation where a family of a disappeared person uh, on its own asks for the person to be, uh, to be found dead, which also, of course, also, also happens. But generally, the presumption is that the person is alive. And how that is, uh, one of the ways that that is approached by the working group, our recommendation to Albania in 2017, where the working group uh, did not only recommend to and protect places where suspected remains of victims are, but also where the victims were, uh, were suspected to be detained. And for families that are still hoping for their loved ones to be alive, uh, a better uh, that that's the, the the last place where they were known to be detained is a good, uh, probably safer place where they feel better to commemorate their forcibly disappeared person. So moving on to the second challenge, which I believe is very specific to enforced disappearances, is the difference between enforced disappearances and the broader term missing person, which we will hear probably a bit more about in the next uh, in the next presentation. The um, standards um, and the comments of the working group concern enforced disappearances. So those are the deprivation of liberty, which are uh, performed with the state. And after that, they refuse to acknowledge or, or, or the fate of whereabouts are concealed. However, many persons uh, disappear for other reasons. So they're disappeared by non-state actors. They are disappeared in armed conflict or by natural disasters. Um, and for very practical reasons, a uh, state might not be able to, when they try to make commemorative efforts, might not be able to differentiate between those that uh, fit the definition of enforced disappearances and those that are not. And when looking actually at the uh, legislation of um, that is uh, adopted by states, uh, we can see that uh, in a lot of situations, states would choose uh, to um, commemorate all of the persons that were disappeared during a particular time, a particular conflict, or in a particular area. Uh, so that will not differentiate between forcibly disappeared and missing persons. However, the standards, and that needs to be uh, considered, they concern enforced uh, disappearances. And uh, moving on to, to the third challenge uh, I would like to mention, uh, it concerns the families uh, of uh, forced uh, disappeared persons. And they um, experience something which has been called ambiguous loss. Uh, that's a state uh, with unclear loss that results of the fact that they do not know, they do not believe whether their loved one is alive uh, or dead, absent or present. It has been also very poetically framed as being psychologically present and physically absent. And uh, this uh, state, which the family lives through, often for decades, uh, also influences how the particular family members are approaching commemorative uh, issues. Uh, the way that they experience this ambiguous loss also change, changes over time. Um, and to a family that might uh, initially do not agree to a commemorative measure might agree to it or might want it at a later part of, 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 of the process. Uh, so uh, this leads to, to a very obvious uh, solution that uh, families of disappeared persons need to be uh, closely consulted with uh, in the process of establishing commemorative efforts. And this is of course true for all victims of human rights abuses. However, what I would like to flag is that this ambiguous loss influences also the change uh, of needs that the families might have and how they approach the disappearance. And this needs to be also um, addressed by uh, any uh, state-driven initiatives on commemorating those disappearances. Here an example of, uh, of a comment of the working group. It commented with regard to Turkey in 2016 that the state should support um, social uh, civil society remembrance initiatives that are taking place, particularly in the east of Turkey. Um, so this shows that there should be support to grassroots initiatives. But at the same time, uh, the working group also uh, stated, uh, stressed the importance of state-driven, state-sponsored uh, memorials. So this, it's not, while the state should support those grassroots initiatives, that is not all that the state should do, especially if those are enforced disappearances, clearly for which the state is responsible. So there needs to be some uh, somehow of both, of connecting uh, those grassroots initiatives and initiating other efforts in connection and in dialogue with families. 
And uh, this dialogue, it's not enough to just establish it for setting up a monument or memorial. It needs to be going on because, as I said in the beginning of, of this part, of the ambiguous laws and of the possible change uh, of, uh, of, of approach as well. And an interesting example comes from Colombia, where a memorial of a collective forced disappearance was temporarily stored. So it was first at another place and then it was temporarily stored in the military unit. Uh, were the perpetrators that the perpetrators belonged to uh, and the families were not consulted about that and the Inter-American Court of Human Rights found that this is uh, unacceptable and it's uh, re-victimizing uh, those families. Um, and I, I wanted to mention that to show that uh, families should be consulted throughout the whole process of commemorating. It's not just enough to, uh, to consult them when setting up uh, a system. So uh, summing up uh, so that we can uh, go on to the next uh, uh, next presentation, which I'm really uh, looking forward uh, to, um, there is an, a clear increase in, um, uh, in the governance of memory with regard to enforced disappearances. This is visible both in the activities of the working group, in, 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 in the activities of the committee on enforced disappearances, but also when looking at domestic legislation. So the last decade has seen many new laws adopted with regard to commemorating um, not only enforced disappeared persons but also missing persons. Um, secondly, states are obliged under uh, international law to take some actions and here the scope is very broad so states can choose different actions but they need uh, need to, to do something about that. And to interpret how that can be seen, uh, I think that the working group uh, the reports and state visits are very useful as they point to, in very specific situations, to point to, uh, to very concrete obligations. And I pointed out three challenges that I believe memory governance uh, faces when we talk about enforced disappearances. So firstly, um, uh, that uh, in commemorative initiatives and for uh, the enforced disappeared person need to, uh, should be presumed alive unless stated differently by the family. But that should be kind of the, the point, starting point of commemoration. Um, then there's a clear challenge for states when adopting um, practices, legislation to differentiate between forcibly disappeared persons and missing persons. And in particular, when time passes, this might be very difficult for, for states to, to convene. And as we know, commemorative uh, activities are often undertaken many decades after the disappearance happened. Um, and last, not least, uh, the needs of families are highly relevant and they need to be considered. And um, the, the perfect way to consider them would be to approach them flexible, to, to be aware that the, the needs might change with time. And so might their approach towards uh, commemorative actions. Um, OK, so, so thank you. And I'm looking forward to, to the further presentations. Thank you so much, uh, Gorgina. It was uh... A uh, fascinating presentation again. Uh, I will now give the floor to, to Catherine Bumberger. Uh, and I think it's a great transition, of course, because now we are moving on to the question of how to secure the rights of families of the missing. And we'll explore with you, uh, thanks to your presentation, the, the path of state responsibility. Okay. Thank you very, very much. And thank you. That was a terrific presentation, Graziana. And it's, it's a great follow. We're just like a double act here. Um, and thank you, Ula. Thank you also to the members of the Asser Institute, to the Miela Project, and of course, the UN Working Group on Enforcement and Voluntary Disappearances. Um, I'm doing a double act also with Sana, my colleague, um, who's handling the presentation, and I'll just be speaking. So thank you. Um, Sana, would you mind going to the next slide? Uh, just building on exactly what um, was just said now by Graziana, uh, I just want to underscore something that she said uh, with this picture that you have in front of you. There was a trend for a while among families of the missing who fled the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia and lived as diaspora families in Europe to reconstruct photos of their families that would include a photoshopped image of the missing person from the conflict, often the father or the husband or the brother, thus keeping um, the memory alive through a Frankenstein-like reconstruction of the family that uh, then was used as uh, along with a contemporary photo of the children or other members of the family. And as you cont contemplate this image, I want to uh, start the presentation on securing the rights of families of the missing as a state responsibility and to note a recent trend um, to conduct surveys in various parts of the world about what families of the missing want. And this builds very nicely on Graziana's presentation. 
um, because there's been a lot of debate about this. Uh, do they want closure? Do they want the right to know? Do they want justice, the truth? Uh, do they want to find the missing person first and then have justice? Do they want to keep custody of the children when husbands disappear? Um, this often happens that women have lost their husbands. They may have been in an arranged marriage and what they want is just custody of the children, property rights, etc. But I want to put before you, as Graziana said so eloquently, um, that we all may be missing persons. We all may have families of the missing, we all may be families of the missing one day, and we all want different things. You may want closure, I may want justice, somebody else may want a right to know, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. What is important here is that while families of the missing have various needs and wishes, states are obligated to secure those rights equally for all, including to justice including the right to an effective investigation, reparations, as well as appropriate expressions of commemoration and memorialization. Next slide. Uh, the responsibility of states um, include proper investigations, which strive for factual accuracy that are reinforced by independent review, uh, hopefully going to court. When states do not effectively investigate missing persons cases, uh, they violate human rights of the next of kin. Uh, they prevent adequate memorialization and they, they fail to advance the rule of law. Therefore, proper investigations, including criminal investigations, are the best way to safeguard the right of memorialization as a human right. Next slide. And this builds on the concept, and, and thank you, Mila, I think it's a wonderful declaration. I said this earlier when we were um, talking about this. And just for your own reflection, I'm building, I'm, I mean, it's on, on the term good governance, and maybe you could consider good memory governance um, as, as part of the direct declaration, building upon the two uh, slides I showed earlier, and building on the need to uphold human rights and advance the rule of law, uh, and to ensure and demonstrate equal treatment and respect for all human beings. Um, next slide. I'm going through this quickly because I know we're behind time. Uh, Graziana also very eloquently spoke about the convention, and this is, of course, the 10th anniversary of the convention going into force. Uh, Iraq, I believe, was the state that signed the convention in 2010, allowing the convention to go into force. And of course, the state, the, the convention recognizes the prominent role that the state plays in securing rights. Uh, and in, in securing rights, uh, particularly of individuals that have been forcibly disappeared. Uh, the convention itself is a milestone in uh, defining state obligations. And ICMP is working with countries around the world to ensure that they also sign the convention. And we're also helping various countries around the world, along with you, uh, to help them create implementing legislation um, in their domestic laws. So I just want to say very categorically that this is a seminal piece of, of legislation and, and really marks a departure or the beginning, let's say, of our understanding of what states should do and what, what and in terms of obligated obligations towards securing the rights of families of the missing. Um, again, following on what Graziana said, uh, persons are not only missing from being enforceably or from enforced disappearance. Uh, there are millions of people missing worldwide from wars from human rights abuses, including uh, being forcibly disappeared. They're missing from organized violence, including human trafficking and human slavery. They're missing from disasters, uh, both man-made um, and natural disasters. They're also missing from migration. So they're missing from a host of circumstances uh, that are involuntary. And sometimes you can't distinguish between the two. Uh, for example, in the case of Syria, uh, there are persons missing from the regime of Hafez al-Assad. There are persons missing from the current conflict under the most horrific circumstances. Uh, the misery of disappearances and other human rights abuses and crimes against humanity in Syria do not end at the border. Uh, they continue across the border into the Mediterranean, um, where Syrians are not only fleeing, being disappeared by Daesh, uh, by violence, uh, are also going missing in maritime disasters. Uh, they're also being trafficked. So the, the Syrian context is extremely complex because missing Syrians now are missing from all for all of these reasons. So finding these individuals and securing the rights of families of the missing will require an investigation that concerns every single one of these categories. Who are the missing? Uh, next slide. 
Uh, the majority of missing are men. I mean, this is not to say that women are not targeted, and we can get into that, but looking around the world uh, at cases of missing persons from all the categories I mentioned before, uh, the majority are men. And we know this as ICMP very well, having used DNA as the pri having helped uh, use DNA as the primary form of identification in the Western Balkans. Uh, we can say categorically, using science, that 90%, almost 90% of those missing in the context of the Bosnian conflict uh, were men. Uh, they're primarily civilians also around the world. They're the poor, minorities, and migrants. So who are the survivors? They're primarily women and children, and we need to look at that very carefully, uh, because whether the person is missing and could potentially be dead or alive, it's mainly female survivors whose rights we're trying to secure. Next slide, please. I want to wander for a moment into an issue that has been troubling a lot of us for a long time, um, every day. Uh, is there a double standard? Um, citizens of rich countries, and here put in whatever term we want, rich, developed, Western countries, um, especially if they're from majority populations, can expect uh, effective investigations when their relatives go missing. We can expect in those cases that law enforcement and other domestic law institutions are responsible for conducting investigations. However, in these countries, there's a growing number of cases of, of that are not properly investigated, uh, that are open cases. Witness what's happening in Canada, where there's a very high number of First Nation women uh, whose cases have not been resolved. This is true of minorities and migrants in the United States. If you're a Black woman, uh, it is more likely that your case is unresolved as opposed to majority populations. And in Europe, um, we have to note, of course, and I hope everyone knows this, Europe today, sadly, has the highest number of dead and missing migrants in the world, and the number is now up to 20,000. The situation, next slide, please, in, in the rest of the world is much more dire, uh, where legacies of enforced disappearance, human rights abuse, and organized crime uh, where there are high numbers of missing persons, there are usually um, no investigations, proper investigations, or they're rare or inadequate. And often what's left in the rest of the world is searching and tracing efforts, often left to NGOs or humanitarian organizations, um, or often, as is the case as we see very often in Mexico, for example, mothers themselves who have missing relatives with their own hands are excavating mass graves. This should not happen. I've put a picture here of a recent panel discussion um, we had in The Hague, uh, where ICMP is based. Uh, and the woman, uh, Ugandan woman, before you, Nora Forham, uh, has missed, uh, is missing her son, um, who uh, miss went missing as a consequence of the Lord's Resistance Army. And she asks during the debate that we have, uh, she, she wants closure, but of course she wants justice as well. And she asks, will she ever have justice? Next slide. Just quickly, ICMP itself, uh, we're now uh, entering our 25th year, so we're no longer a teenager. Um, we're, we're becoming, uh, we became an uh, inter intergovernmental treaty-based international organization in 2014. And the work that we're doing is conceptually building upon the convention itself, but taking it further. And the convention, uh, I'm sorry, the treaty uh, governing ICMP, uh, the mandate is to secure the cooperation of governments and other authorities to locate missing persons, again, from all causes, not just in forced disappearance, but all the causes I alluded to earlier. Um, and that ICMP was established on the premise of state responsibility, um, which is discharged by judicial and related institutions. And that treaty is available on our website, or we can send it to you if you'd like to see it. Next slide. The underlying um, principles that I'm referring to here uh, refer to a declaration that ICMP put together, like Mila, we, have, we, have, we also have a declaration uh, that we put together in 2014 defining state responsibility in terms of uh, missing persons from conflict and human rights abuses. The declaration was signed in the West, by countries in the Western Balkans in 2014. Uh, in 2018, um, all European states signed it. And in 2019, sorry, 2018, uh, we advanced a new set of principles that go beyond conflict uh, and cases of missing persons uh, from human rights abuses, again, to ensure that there are these principles apply to all cases of missing persons. Next slide. 
In the questions that you included as discussion questions, um, one of the concerns or one of the issues you wanted highlighted, um, the ASSER Institute, was uh, operationalizing the truth. So, I, building upon that, I'd like to go into how states operationalize state responsibility. Well, first, there has to be political will. And I would say that there are a few countries in the world that have exhibited the political will uh, to find missing persons, particularly uh, when there are cases of enforced disappearance. Uh, I mean, I mean, sorry, uh, Colombia, through the peace agreement, stands in stark contrast where the creation of a search unit uh, to search for missing persons is embodied, for example, in the peace agreement, which is fantastic. So Colombia obviously has the political will, even though the number of cases continue to rise uh, despite the peace agreement. Um, the picture I have here is one of Bosnia-Herzegovina, where we help Bosnia create a missing persons institute. So part of building the infrastructure within a state requires building specific state institutions, task forces, what have you, as well as legislation that secures the rights of families of the missing. Next slide, please. States also need to create central records of those who went missing. In other words, they need themselves through these state institutions to provide reliable and accurate information to their citizens uh, regarding who went missing. And in some cases, this could be all a state can do. When we're looking at Iraq, for example, the numbers are extremely high. Uh, there are at least 250,000 uh, people missing in Iraq from the regime of Saddam Hussein, from the war with Iran, from the first Gulf War, uh, from 2003 onward, Daesh crimes, etc. So if the state could just build a central record of who went missing, uh, this could also possibly serve as a way to memorialize those who went missing if they cannot all be found, which would be very difficult. Next slide, please. Uh, when we talk about conducting impartial, um, credible, and transparent investigations in line with the rule of law, um, I'm just showing you this picture here uh, because states can do two things. Um, mass graves themselves are wounds in the earth's crust. And I think as the Mila Declaration or, or uh, website uh, uh, alludes to, you cannot walk away from this um, and say, here it is, it exists, we can build a, a, erect a memorial over uh, this earth, as you can see here, here in, the, in the photograph that shows a grassy field with shrubs on top of it, or, and this is the same location, we can begin a proper investigation into that site. Uh, and you can see the, sign, uh, the, the crime scene tape here. Um, and we would believe here, I think, by conducting a proper investigation in line with international standards or to a standard where that evidence can be provided to an international court is a form of truth telling. As, as Benjamin Disraeli said, uh, justice is truth in action. Uh, next slide, please. Also using advanced DNA technologies and, and DNA systems um, such as, well, technologies such as DNA, sorry, uh, are also very helpful and, and, and really are useful in a modern world. I mean, both these, you know, beginning to excavate mass grave sites. I mean, this really happened you know, in the last several decades. Now the use of DNA is more common um, today than it was when we began using it a couple decades ago. But DNA provides irrefutable evidence of a person's identity. Again, whether they're alive or dead, there could be children in, let's say, detention centers in the Mediterranean, uh, who have now gotten older, who have no documents, you need genetics to be able to prove the identity. But let me just uh, linger for a moment on this slide. Uh, many people have said that science, using science is a cold way of dealing with this issue. I mean, I would put before you that using genetics um, is actually the warmest thing you can do because you're, you're providing a piece of yourself to find someone you love. Uh, and, you know, this is, in a way, being able to do this, to make this kinship analysis requires memory also, because in order to find that missing person, to give a reference sample, that also follows the memory of loving somebody. And that memory, um, if you're looking at you know, the conflicts that took place in World War II, Bosnia, the Spanish Civil War, the conflicts throughout Africa, it is those that are searching for them who want to give of themselves to find that missing person. A blood sample becomes a powerful symbol of doing this. It's also hugely democratizing. Uh, in our work in the former Yugoslavia, we helped the states 
there collect data, including genetic data, but we collected that data from every single missing person who wanted to report a missing person. We ended up collecting data from 100,000 families of the missing, which meant that each individual who had a missing person had the ability to find that missing person. And we ended up finding over 70% of the 40,000 people who went missing. Next slide. Um, providing effective remedies is one of the most difficult things, and I've never seen a state that has done this well. Um, in fact, what tends to happen, given that the majority of missing um, are men and those left behind are women, is that often uh, securing the rights of female survivors depends on the circumstances of the death or disappearance of the male member of the family. Um, that's not a way to go. There should be a way to provide effective rem remedies, um, regardless of the circumstances of the person who has gone missing. Finally, just to conclude here, I just uh, two more slides and I'm done. Uh, there is a memorial in Barcelona, um, which uh, the city of Barcelona has erected in memory of those migrants who've gone missing. Uh, and I just wanted you to see this, and I think it's quite beautiful. Um, and it does refer to the Mediterranean becoming a mass grave. Just finally to end, uh, are we at risk of creating a, a double standards and what are the consequences of that? Um, in, in the end, this will undermine state responsibility and accountability. It will weaken the ability to secure rights for all. It elevates group rights over universal rights, and it increases the likelihood of state-sponsored false narratives, which is also a question that was posed by the Asser uh, Institute. And it erodes awareness of foundation, the foundations of pluralistic and democratic societies, and it reinforces xenophobic trends. Uh, that's it from my end. Um, and I'll leave you with this picture of a woman in Libya uh, who's searching for her missing son. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Catherine, for this uh, great presentation and exploring uh, these legal and institutional proposition for operationalizing truth, but also for sharing all these uh, stories and eloquent facts with us. Um, I'm now uh, going to give the floor to uh, Leon Castellanos Jankiewicz. Uh, uh, to explore truth and transitional justice in the case of Latin America. The floor is yours, Leon. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for this generous introduction. And thank you all for joining us for this very important panel. Rebecca, can you hear me? Thank you. I think that it's wonderful that um, Catherine has emphasized the oper operationalization of the implementation of uh, the norms related to enforced disappearance, because I want to talk about this in a regional context. And just to give a bit of flavor and of examples of how the issue and the problem of enforced disappearances occurs in Latin America in this case. And I've chosen a frame to discuss this. I've cho chosen the frame of transitional justice, which is a very specific concept that has been applied over time in Latin America in order to forward the development of certain human rights and to strengthen the protection of victims and increase the accountability of perpetrators. And transitional justice, what it has done, it has created a structure through which societies can coalesce and come together in order to improve the human rights uh, conditions of a country, and as the name itself states, transitional justice, in order to bring a society from one place forward to the, ne to the next. So from a very traumatic experience, usually, from a situation of uh, dictatorship or uh, where crimes against humanity are being committed or serious violations of human rights, to uh, a society which embraces pluralism and values diversity. and. The only slide that I want to share with you today is one which illustrates this concept of transitional justice. It's a painting by a Russian artist in the 30s, Malievich. And we see here four peasants standing uh, along a black line, a straight black line, and they all seem to be equal in their rank, dignity, and status if we look at their size, if we look at their height, uh, their proportions, they seem very athletic and able-bodied uh, individuals, human beings. 
Uh, but at the same time, and that's what justice is, it's equality for all without discrimination as to sex, uh, gender, race, political preference, etc. But if we look closely, there are very subtle differences, or some are not so subtle, in each and every one of these figures. We have different colors uh, of the faces. We have some colors which recur. All of the faces have a white side, and it's the same side. And we also have um, different combinations of, of colors in the different. So all of these colors could mean very different things, and it, but it does not take away from their individual dignity and their very basic equality. And this is what transitional justice uh, is about. It is a way uh, of enabling every country and every social body to figure out a form of coming together and overcoming a terrible tragedy. And it doesn't have to be the same way in the Balkans as it has been in Latin America or as it is today in East and Central uh, Europe, in, in some cases, such as Ukraine. Um, it can be different for everyone, every society. And in the case of Latin America, transitional justice has played a very big role in securing the right to truth uh, in societies which have undergone very traumatic experiences, in particular with military dictatorships uh, in, in the previous century and uh, later on with grave violations of human rights. And so I'll just stop sharing the presentation now to continue the presentation, uh, telling you about transitional justice and enforced disappearance in Latin America, which has been operationalized and going back to con uh, the concept uh, highlighted by Catherine through the right to truth, which is of course a pillar, a fundamental pillar of transitional justice alongside three other pillars, which are access to the judiciary, reparations to victims, and guarantees from the state of non-repetition. Those are the pillars of transitional justice. And so if we take them all together, we see that they address the social dimension of uh, the law and the social dimension of structural violence as well. In particular, if we look at the jurisprudence of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, we see that the right to memory and truth is guaranteed and really highlighted in the jurisprudence. In a case that was decided in 2012 called uh, Diario Militar, the court considered that the recovery, and I quote, of the memory and dignity of the victims in the case was of the utmost importance and ordered the state, in this case Guatemala, to produce a documentary on the facts of the case because such initiatives are significant for both the preservation of the memory and the satisfaction of the victims in order to highlight the reestablishment of the historical memory in democratic society. So the court here, notice how it's keeping, keeping the victim-oriented dimension and the social dimension of the problem in perspective within the same judgment, within the same sentence, actually. If we get closer to the concept and to the problem of forced disappearance, we see that the court has said that forced disappearance is a permanent and continuous violation of multiple rights. It's not just one act uh, which is an instantaneous act and which uh, once the person disappears, the cause uh, of action disappears with the person. No, there is a continuous and permanent violation of multiple rights. And these include right to liberty, right to access to justice, to humane treatment, to life, and to the recognition as a person before the law. And of course, this is equally important for the person, the individual who's been forcibly disappeared, as it is to the families of that person, the direct family members, to next of kin, uh, and to their next of kin. And, and in, in regards to those, to those uh, people, the next of kin and the families, the court also recognizes that the denial of the right to truth in the context of enforced disappearance as regards a family member could amount to cruel and inhuman treatment, which is essentially the language used in international law for the definition of torture. So the Inter-American Court of Human Rights goes very, very far 
in operationalizing, again, using Kat's very useful concept, the right to truth in the context of enforced disappearance. And of course, uh, again, I'm going back to my frame of transitional justice in order to, to show you how the specificities of Latin American societies and Latin American history and Latin American challenges in terms of human rights and governance has affected the development of the protection of these rights. I want to turn to a second area where transitional justice and truth has played a significant role in Latin American, uh, in the Latin American human rights regime, in the inter-American human rights regime, but more in the Latin American context. And that is in the field of amnesties. And very briefly, because I want to uh, save some time for questions and answers, amnesties, as you know, were implemented in the 1970s uh, in the aftermath of military dictatorships in order to uh, secure impunity for Latin American leaders uh, and people who were in powerful positions and at the same time were involved in the commission of atrocities. And in the 80s, we saw lots of truth and reconciliation commissions uh, trying to dismantle or trying to confront themselves to these amnesties. And uh, until in the 2000s, we see that the concept of transitional justice becomes important, uh, that these societies are now, have now uh, consolidated their democracies and parliamentary systems. And so amnesties are rolled back. And in 2001, in the decision Barrios Altos versus Peru, the Inter-American Court emphasizes the existence of a prohibition of amnesties for serious human rights violations and crimes against humanity, including torture, arbitrary or extrajudicial executions, and here it comes, enforced disappearance. So transitional justice and the right to truth in particular has played a very important role in the outlawing of amnesties in Latin America and in the inter-American system in particular. Now, of course, we have a series of new sorts of amnesties which are being implemented specifically in, in Colombia and Mexico, which have uh, very different situations as regard their internal security but, and challenges. But overall, the amnesties and the important point I want to make here in order to close this uh, small uh, talk I'm, I'm sharing with you, the important point is that these amnesties do not cover the leaders or perpetrators of these crimes. They are essentially tailored to protect the victim's right to access to justice or to ensure that people who have been in unlawfully incarcerated have access to remedies in order to be able to uh, be excarcerated. So again, the concept of truth and memory hazy as it might be, and also transitional justice, is just to, uh, if implemented and operationalized within that framework of transitional justice, is able to have a really concrete effect in national jurisdictions, national legislations, and ultimately the lives of the victims and those who have suffered the most. And with that, I want to share one more image, one more slide to highlight the plight of the victims, and these are the 43 students of Ayotzinapa in my home country, Mexico, who disappeared in 2014, and most of whose whereabouts are to this day unknown. I hope that these discussions we're having today and this kind of outreach and event uh, is helpful in order for us to come together as a society, accept what's happened, and talk about a way forward together. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Leon. Uh, I will uh, give the floor now to uh, uh, our uh, our last uh, guest, Mr. Bernard Duhaime. Um, thank you for for joining us. You weren't here at the very beginning. Uh, welcome, and uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation as. Uh, the attendees, I'm sure, on enforced disease appearances, truth, memory, and international law. The floor is yours, Bernard. 
Thank you. Uh, I apologize for arriving a bit late. Uh, technology and I are not best friends. Um, it's an honor to be among uh, such a distinguished group of experts. Uh, and I would like to thank the Asar Institute for uh, organizing this great uh, event. Um, and I'm also glad that we're able to do it uh, together uh, with the working group. Uh, as you know, we are trying to find uh, every day more ways to reach out and exchange with colleagues, but also to reach out with the families and different associations. Uh, as you know, it is our 40th anniversary, the 40th anniversary of our creation. I'm not sure it's something that should be celebrated, but it's certainly something that should be acknowledged because the working group is the result of years of struggle and pressure by civil society organizations. Hopefully, our working group will no longer be needed one day, and that will be something to celebrate. Um, I wanted to um, talk about um, human rights, uh, the right to memory and uh, to uh, truth. I'm going to try to share this PowerPoint with you. Uh, hopefully it will work. Uh, let me know if I, I presume. Yes, okay, good. Very good. So, um, okay. So I will, I will try to accelerate a little bit time that we have uh, around uh, minutes left so i will uh, i will try to to speed up um as you know uh enforced disappearances uh, as Gratzina uh, referred to earlier is, is is a complex human rights violation that has multi levels but it is basically the deprivation of liberty against the wills against the will of a person it involves state agents or done with the acquiescence of state agents and it's followed by the refusal of the recognition of the deprivation of liberty or the concealment of the fate or whereabouts of the person. Um, it has different uh, consequences, including, uh, as, as we've been saying earlier, violations of the right to truth and its impact on the right to, to memory. The working group, um, whoops, sorry, the working group um, on enforced or involuntary disappearances has a um, different functions. It has a, a humanitarian function to process cases, but also has uh, a, a general function to generate, you know, to formulate general recommendations to governments that um, in order for them to implement their obligations contained in the 1992 Declaration on Enforced Disappearances. Uh, by doing so, we often go and visit different countries and uh, hold sessions in different countries, often in sites of memory as we did in Argentina in 2015, when we held our session at the ESMA. Uh, similarly, when we held a session in Rabat, we also visited uh, sites of memories in Casablanca uh, as well, uh, to, to show the importance of our, uh, the, of, of that, we, uh, that we consider for, for, for these types of initiatives. Um, also, as Gratzina was saying, a lot of our um, uh, work related to, to memory uh, is often uh, during country visits, where we also uh, visit uh, places of memory, and we often uh, meet with the, the families as well as the, the state officials to address these issues. I'll come back to that. But in our recent visits to Peru, Sri Lanka, Turkey, Albania, the Gambia, Ukraine, uh, and uh, Central Asia, uh, we've addressed these issues extensively, as um, was said earlier. Um, our work related to uh, truth and memory is, of course, part of our uh, the general recommendations that we make with regards to uh, reparations, one of the obligations contained in Article 19 of the Declaration. And we've you know, extensively developed these concepts, in particular in our 1999 uh, annual report, where we explained a little bit more what we meant by uh, the reparation, um, which includes uh, the right to restoration of dignity and reputation, guarantee of non-repetition, non as well as um, measures to ensure truth and memory. Of course, uh, since 2006, 
is uh, more uh, specifically inserted in the uh, Article 24 of the 2006 Convention on Enforcement of Involuntary Disappearances. Um, then um, also the ex uh, extended our these concepts in our 2013 annual report, which contains a specific portion of the report related to reparations, which in turn contains sections on truth and memory. Um, very quickly on the right to truth, the working group has been one of the first uh, institutions to address this actually in the first uh, annual report of the working group back in 1981, just after its creation. The working group was uh, strongly affirming the rights of, of families to truth as a fundamental human rights. As you know, this is something that is based in international humanitarian law, uh, in particular uh, in, in, the, in the, well, it goes back a long way, but in particular in um, protocol number one, um, but it also has uh, had a more developed, uh, uh, you know, jurisprudential developments as um, was, uh, um, uh, in the Inter-American Court of Human Rights Jurisprudence, in the 2006 study on the, uh, of, the, of the High Commissioner, and um, more recently in our um, 2010 General Comment on the Right to Truth, which, oops, sorry. Okay, sorry. Um, as well as in very extensive um, uh, detailed decisions of the Inter-American Court. I refer you also to different other reports from regional institutions, um, in particular the Inter-American Court, that did um, a specific study on this. In our 2010 uh, comment, we addressed uh, different aspects of the right to truth, in particular related to the search and investigation, the creation of specialized units, um, the protocol for recovery of remains, public has access to state files and records, as um, was mentioned by my friend. And These are all uh, re types of recommendations, for example, that we uh, formulate through our country visits, uh, in, in our uh, visit to Peru, for example, a series of recommendations were made with, with respect to, um, you know, uh, is establishing institutions that would focus on the search and establish the truth, as well as uh, forensic uh, uh, institutions and and uh, you know preserving uh, burial sites and so forth. Um, now moving on, we're very quickly to the right to to memory. I uh, just wanted to say that you know our I, we have addressed. Uh, also uh, extensively in uh, different uh, reports of ours in 2010 and 2013, um, linked to the duty to, to, to remember, uh, in a, also in a recent uh, 2013 report, um, the right to memory as a collective right, something that has been extensively developed by the Inter-American Court, as was uh, said earlier, and also contained in the updated set of principles for the protection and prote uh, promotion of human rights through the fight against impunity, which uh, refers to uh, you know the concept of memory as a people's right to uh, knowledge of the, the of the history um, of its oppression as part of its heritage, and as such, it must be ensured by appropriate measures in the fulfillment of the state's duty to preserve archives, other evidence concerning human rights violations and humanitarian law uh, uh, violations, and to facilitate knowledge of those violations. Such measures should be aimed at preserving the collective memory from extinction, in particular at guarding against the development of revisionist and negationist um, arguments. Um, so I think these are standards that are extremely important to look at when we are addressing these issues. When uh, we uh, we have addressed this in the past, we've constantly marked the importance of uh, establishing sites and monuments in accordance with these standards and with the participation of victims and civil society. Uh, of course, there are uh, very interesting uh, uh, sites that uh, the working group has had the chance to visit, um, in particular, the Parque de la Memoria in Buenos Aires, um, 
which has the symbolizes not only the, the the long list of all the disappeared but also the um the cemetery the the the, the aquatic cemetery uh, which is the 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 river of la plata where uh, many of the disappeared have this, uh, been this, uh, thrown uh, during the flights of death uh, also some images here of the um, museum uh, uh, in santiago de chile I wanted to show these in contrast to uh, our uh, a bit shocking uh, uh, contact with the, some memorials and lack of memorials in Sri Lanka during our visits. When we went in the north, we could see um, uh, lots of you know enormous uh, memorials to the of of, of uh, you know the uh, the official uh, uh, the government, the army, and so forth. But um, surprisingly, very little had been done to recognize the rights of the families uh, of, uh, of disappearances to, to truth and memory, so much that the families that had to uh, set up their own memorials with their own without the help of the, of the, of the state. So we formulated a series of uh, recommendations in that respect. Um, so I wanted to show uh, also some of the recommendations that we had formulated to Peru in our 2015 visit, uh, several recommendations, uh, uh, you know, on places of, of remembrance, uh, the creation of, of, of sites of memory, museums, uh, shrines at the Cucho uh, site where um, a grave where many people as well as the obligation to coordinate, you know, and designing programs to uh, ensure the memory uh, through different uh, forms, including through uh, educational uh, uh, and communication uh, uh, activities. Uh, these are especially uh, important if we look at um, the uh, principle number three to the set of principles I was referring to, because uh, states should uh, uh, preserve the collective memory uh, and guard it against the development of revisionist and negationist arguments. You see here a series of examples of, um, uh, of, 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 of the denial of the existence of disappearances uh, back in uh, the 70s and early 80s in Latin America when some uh, newspapers were um, simply trying to deconstruct the, the reality saying that these people were not disappeared or were terrorists and so forth. These are, of course, uh, issues that are not issues of the past. Uh, you will recall uh, recently the debates that took place in Brazil regarding the anniversary of the of the coup, as well as the, the debates regarding the uh, the suggestion to change the curriculum regarding the human rights violations that occurred at that time. Um, uh, we went to uh, do uh, uh, one of our sessions in Sarajevo recently and. Uh, were informed of the extensive efforts that are being undertaken to uh, either hide or revisit the uh, existence of the 1995 genocide in uh, academic uh, curricula or through uh, municipal measures or uh, the establishment of a new uh, commission to establish what has happened there. Uh, so these are uh, these are still uh, events that are uh, marking our reflection today, and we need to be looking at this very closely when uh, we formulate our recommendations to governments. Uh, if you are interested uh, by a, a broader discussion on the issue of memory, I encourage you to look at a recent book published by uh, Laval University Presses here in Quebec. Uh, published by two sociologists, well, sociologists and historians on the uh, obligation of memory, which contains a text that I, I wrote on this week. Um, in conclusion, I wanted to perhaps, based on the discussions that have been, uh, or the, the elements that have been raised earlier by my colleagues, which I thank, um, perhaps make a, a broader uh, a, a question mark with respect to time, time as a controversial and complicated or cross-cutting factor that tints the way um, we look at human rights violations. Of course, there's the obvious uh, debate of, you know, in, in transitional context, as was said earlier, of, of how we reconcile, you know, the need to move on and the need to maintain the memory. Uh, but of course, these are not two um, uh, uh, opposite and irreconcilable views. In fact, my personal take on this is that 
they have to be reconciled, they have to work together, in particular in the context of enforced disappearances, because the crime of enforced disappearance is an intergenerational, uh, has an intergenerational uh, uh, impact. It does not go away. Sometimes it might skip a generation or two that wants to rebuild normality for the family and so forth, but eventually it comes back. We look at what uh, grandchildren or great great grandchildren have been doing in Spain or grandchildren have been doing in Argentina. This intergenerational impact makes it uh, persistent through time and requires the state to take into consideration this. Another aspect is the, um, the fact that it, it generates other human rights violations. The fact that it's so intimately look, linked to the right to truth provides uh, for uh, additional challenges. The time factor uh, provides additional challenges, in particular in terms of jurisdiction, uh, um, who and, and, and up to who can uh, address these issues and up to where in time are we looking at these issues. You're probably familiar with the um, uh, communications that we've had with the government of Turkey regarding uh, the, the the missing individuals from the the um, from the time of the uh, of World War One in the twenties uh, and and the Armenian minority of the Ottoman Empire. We've had a, a discussion with the government of Turkey on this, so it raises really complex jurisdictional uh, issues. Lastly, but not, um, well, the, the last I wanted to address the the fact that um, as was said earlier. Um, the denial of memory can have other uh, impacts on moral integrity. Uh, Diario Militar uh, uh, addressed this in 2013, but I think we can probably take it to a next level if in certain circumstances. In the case of Moiwana village against uh, Suriname in 2010, which was not specifically linked to enforced disappearances, but was linked to places of memory preventing a group of um, uh, of maroons to access a site was considered as a violation of moral integrity because uh, of the incapacity of these people to exercise their religion on these sites. So moral integrity, right to religion. Uh, but also, if we look at uh, the Chitai uh, versus Guatemala case in 2010, which is a case that I argued with some of my students and, and human rights defenders in Guatemala, we were able to demonstrate that these also had impacts on the indigenous people's um, capacity to pass on the culture from one generation to the other. The denial of the existence of the disappearance and its impact on the indigenous leadership at the time and the capacity of indigenous peoples to pass on culture from one generation to the other. So I'm going to stop here. I apologize if it is a bit long and a bit fast. but. Uh, I hope we're able to discuss this at this stage. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will indeed uh, stay a little bit more in any case for the Q&A session. I want as fast as possible to give the floor to Dr. Alexandra Kleszynska grabias for some points of discussion on, on the presentations that were made. Um, Alexandra, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon um, to all panelists and uh, participants. I must say I'm I'm in total panic because I have to join another Zoom meeting in two minutes and I have taken two full pages of notes and comments and observations because it was fascinating to listen to all of you and uh, and these were really great presentations. So just very briefly and some most important, I think, um, thoughts that came to my mind while I was uh, listening to you. Um, so, like, as I said, very general observation and the common, also common denominator for all uh, of the presentations, I think, is that the right to truth and perhaps using the words very carefully, the truth as such uh, should be at the very center of uh, actually everything we do and what we research um, uh, within memory studies um, and uh, within legal governance of history and memory and the past, but also within the field of uh, the rights securing uh, the rights um, and freedoms, human rights um, 
within the phenomenon of missing persons and uh, and forced disappearances. So that would be my my first thought. Um, then another thought that immediately comes to my mind, uh, and in particular in connection to what Ulaj was saying while he was explaining the very concept of memory loss. Um, when we talk about truth, then we should also ask whose truth we are talking about. Uh, this was also mentioned by Ulaj uh, that there are huge discrepancies and differences between um, the way, for example, the Polish people me uh, remember certain events from the Second World War uh, and, and the way the Jewish people remember the same events and the same historical circumstances. The same applies, for example, to Ukrainian um, uh, relations. So it's always a, a very difficult dilemma of what are we talking about when we talk about the truth, when we uh, when we have to deal with most um, most controversial um, uh, issues from the past. Uh, but when it comes to missing persons and forced disappearances, I think that we we should run away as, as, as far as possible from this dilemma of who's truth, because here I think um, the truth is just just the truth. There is one truth about the events that happened, and this is the main task. Then, uh, not to go so deep into the liberations, uh, as this is the case, for example, with these historical debates, but just to establish the truth, and then to go forward to um, to uh, what Grazina said, quoting I don't recall whom she quoted, but she said, "Truth, memory, and justice." Uh, so, so this would be at the center of, of, of our responsibilities and tasks when we talk about uh, missing persons and forced disappearances. Um, and then, uh, so I said the quote that uh, Grazina uh, uh, gave us, but there was also a quote shared by Catherine, and I loved it. Uh, and I, again, forgot uh, and didn't uh, put down who said this, but uh, I quote now, justice is truth in action. This is another leading fault that we should take uh, from this seminar, I think. Uh, so, uh, both Grazina and Katrin spoke about state responsibilities. Actually, almost all presenters uh, were, were addressing this issue, Leon as well. So, state responsibilities. I think uh, there is no controversy or uh, smaller controversies when we talk about uh, the responsibilities of a state when it comes to securing this um, truth and justice. Uh, but then when we talk about the responsibility of the state to secure the memory and memorialization, then we again enter a rather gray zone. Because as we know, and we have witnessed so many times, uh, when the state takes over the responsibility of uh, remembering uh, events, things, and people, uh, this becomes very easily a subject uh, to manipulation, abuse, distortion, and actually enforcing a very particular um, historical narratives. And all governments and all states um, are really uh, eager to do so, uh, which we can observe in the states of uh, East and Central Europe in particular uh, in the recent years, uh, also in case of, of Russia. So that would be uh, another uh, another point I would like to raise. And then um, I, I think I will stop with one more. Uh, Catherine spoke about double standards. Um, double standards in, in securing um, the rights, double standards in access to, to have these rights secured. But I think that it also applies to transitional justice that Leon um, told us about as a transitional justice as a tool to secure the right to truth. Um, of course, he said, and rightfully so, that this um, particular um, elements of transitional justice can differ uh, from state to state, from society to society, and this is fully understandable. Um, but still, um, there is there are the double standards even in the very access to the transitional transitional justice mechanisms in a uh, different uh, uh, corner of the world. Uh, but also, uh, when Bernard spoke about right to memory, this also for me is uh, is, is strictly connected to these double standards. Um, because uh, some groups uh, are deprived um, to have this right uh, secured, uh, some are not, um, and 
double standards as such accompany human rights uh, in general. Um, but also in these uh, contexts that we uh, that we talked about uh, today. And I will stop here and I will say uh, goodbye and thank you uh, very much for, for, for having me among, um, among the participants of this great event. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, Alexandra. You can run to your second meeting. <laughs> thank you for these very sharp points. Alex. Thank you. Bye bye. Uh, so now I would suggest if you all agree, except if there is really a burning point that you want to uh, raise on, on the on the great points that Alexandra just made, I would I would suggest to move on to the questions that were sent out our way uh, for, for the panelists. Um, so uh, I will try, sorry in advance, I will not be able to ask all questions. Let's dedicate maybe 10, 15 minutes to this Q&A ses session. I will try to ask several questions in one uh, sometimes. Uh, so, so the first question is from Natasha Stamenkovic, um, and this is a question mainly um, to uh, Ms. Bomberger and uh, and Baranovska, uh, but uh, more likely that that other panelists could uh, could tackle. So, um, you mentioned the disappearance convention and uh, the fact that it's a crucial milestone for governing the rights of the missing persons. It is important to underline that the convention is yet very vague in terminology. So her question is, is there a risk that the disappearance convention may enforce or enforces already the so-called ambiguous loss for the families of the missing persons, uh, which you also talked about? Um, so, Grazina, if you want to start out on this question. Um, so, uh, just, um, are we only talking about collaborative practices or broad about the convention and uh, ambiguous? Because that's uh, two two different questions, I guess. And well, I think it's um, that's that's the the beauty of international law. It needs to be often drafted very broadly, and then uh, the. Um, uh, the devil lies in the details, how it's implemented. And that's why the treaty bodies and special procedures are important to guide um, states how to do that. And organization as the ICMP, who can also highlight what what can be used and what what what's what's there to, to be abused. But I wouldn't go as far as to say that the convention with um with its how how different things are framed in a convention reinforces that. I think many conventions give states the possibility to do that, and that's where the treaty bodies can step in and say that's how it's supposed to be interpreted or, or another way. And we need to be clear that it's a very young uh, convention, and there there's still a lot of time until um, some of the terms or specifics are going to be um, uh, are going to be concretized. And lastly, I mean even those terms uh, and norms that we know that are very specific, there are still states that try to abuse them. So I think just the fact that states are abusing something is not really an argument for the international law uh, to be drafted in a wrong way. Thank you, Catherine. I, I completely agree uh, with Graciana. I mean, I think the convention, uh, what the failure is, is that, or the challenge is, is that states don't comply with it. That's the biggest challenge. Um, and I would say the other uh, element is, which is what I tried to highlight, is it only focuses on enforced disappearances. In that respect, it doesn't go far enough. So, as I argued in the presentation that I gave, um, and what ICMP is trying to do, along with others, is to ensure that states uh, maintain the obligations that are outlined in the convention and apply them to all cases where people go missing. So whether they're migrants, whether they're missing from um, organized crime, whether they're missing from um, other human rights abuses. And I think that's the challenge that we have in a modern world right now, is ensuring that states that find all missing persons, regardless of the circumstances. Well, thanks a lot. This also addresses another question to Minty Missy, so that's that's very helpful. Um, there is another uh, more specific, um, more specific question uh, on um, so on, on the fact uh, that 
uh, a challenge that needs to be addressed in memorialization is to ensure that the missing per missing persons are presumed alive. Uh, but uh, the, the, the person mentions that academic surveys have shown that in some post-conflict societies, presuming the missing to be alive actually leads to bre breaching certain rights of the surviving family members. So, for example, uh, the wives of the missing men cannot obtain the pension of the missing husband, etc. So, the person asks a question about how to balance best uh, these two clashing interests sometimes. So, and, and also the person is raising concern as to uh, to what extent a state could use memorialization practices to deny rights actually of uh, for of the families of the the missing persons. Maybe I could just start. Yeah, no, no. I, I look the families of the missing. I've been doing this for a long time. They they. Off, they almost always think they're alive. Uh, they believe they're alive, uh, and that's just common. No matter where you are in the world, they they will believe they're alive. And and I think uh, somebody in their presentation also referred to the lingering uncertainty because they don't know whether they're dead or alive. But there is this belief that they are still living. Uh, but regardless, again, of of what the family believes, and and of course we have to be very careful and very you know sentient of that. But the state is obligated to investigate those disappearances regardless of that fact. So the state could operate on the premise, obviously, that the person is alive, but they may find them dead. And in the vast majority of cases we've been dealing with, I mean, if you look at Colombia, 50 year conflict, 120,000 persons missing, uh, most likely the majority are deceased, unfortunately. Probably the same thing. Uh, in cases in so many other conflicts, especially those that have been going on for a long time. But of course, we have to respect uh, the belief that families have, but that doesn't mean the state should not engage in proper investigations, whether the person is dead or alive, we don't know until that investigation is completed. But when it comes to memorials, uh, again, in order to be able to uh, create memorials uh, that respect those rights, um, what we're saying or what I'm trying to say is that states also need to conduct proper investigations into those cases as a part of truth telling, as a part of justice, as a part of securing those rights. Uh, in the case of women who are the primary majority of survivors, um, when there's that uncertainty, uh, there are such things as uh, declarations of absence um, that certain countries have, especially Latin America, have used uh, to um, give credence to the fact that the person doesn't know whether they're dead alive or alive, but still must contain, uh, maintain or collect or secure rights. Uh, so, you know, and, and that acknowledges the ambiguity, but still allows the individual woman to secure rights. Um, that, that that was actually a, a really good question and a really good answer. And just uh, two sentences because it uh, it it was a question to to my presentation. I, I think all those actions need to be in parallel. So uh, if if the state engages in commemoration, that it, it, this needs to to take into account the wish of the family. But at the same time, other obligations with regard to the victims also need to be implemented. And that's uh, that's the cha uh, that's that's the challenge that I. I I was mentioning and I, I believe um, it, it, it sounds really nice on a, an expert panel, but if you're the person that needs to um, set out the domestic legislation, that is really, really difficult. So, uh, so I think that's, uh, that's why I, I really believe it's a, it's a good question, very practical and uh, not easy to solve. It needs to be approached practically. Thank you so much. Um, I have a couple of questions that uh, overlap and concern in general um, truth in context, let's say. And uh, several um, attendees uh, wonder if you could uh, share your views on uh, maybe uh, on on the opportunity to to categorize uh, memory memory laws in context. If if there is a distinction to make and and to draw between memory laws taken, for example, in a context of transitional justice or uh, in a context that is uh, very close to, to uh, facts or atrocities that have been committed or on the contrary, uh, chronologically much later that take place, that are enacted much later um, um, in time. So if you have views on this uh, categorization, if this is something that you have addressed, a question you have addressed uh, in the MELA project as well. So maybe Ulad and Leon can also tackle these questions.
Uh, all right, then I'll take f f the floor first and get then uh, give it to to Leon. There were indeed several classifications of the uh, memory loss in policies, and one of them included these transitional dimensions. In particular, in the book, we've edited with uh, Alexandra Glishinska Gravias. Um, on uh, law and historical memory. Uh, it was published in 2017 um, with Cambridge University Press. We've uh, suggested a typology based on chronological dimensions and also on this, uh, including this aspect of transitional justice. We suggested that first group suggested four groups, uh, in particular, one of the group was uh, this Holocaust denial and uh, Attempts to mimic Holocaust denial as Armenian genocide denialism. This uh, then there was this specific group for transitional context of Central and Eastern Europe and the context of decommunization. The specific group for post dictatorial societies in Spain and in Portugal and the way they overcome uh, um, during their very specific transitions. The um, the, uh, the the memories of of the past. Uh, mentioning this most famous Lady de la. Historia y memoria uh, de la memoria histórica in uh, in in Spain in particular, and then let's say the uh, looking beyond post dictatorial societies in in Europe and in both in, in Spain and Portugal and Central and Eastern Europe elsewhere in in the world, saying that there is also genetic difference. So what I wanted to say with this is that within that typology, transitional justice was present. But it's not that we envisage one type of transitional justice because we see extreme differences when we are trying to compare the way memory legislation or legal governance of memory has been shaped in the context of post dictatorial regime, let's say in central in uh, uh, southern uh, South America, Latin America more broadly, in particular in Chile and Argentina, where we don't face those strong memory loss, but we find different mechanisms, let's say, uh, this mechanism of la justicia de verdad, this uh, this um, justice by virtue of uh, seeking of truth, truth commissions, etc., specifically in the African uh, context. In Whereas in Europe, we find this uh, very hardcore uh, legislation. So what we were attempting to say with this classification is that there is no one single type of transitional justice as far as uh, the design of memory loss uh, is concerned. For the rest, I'll give the floor on uh, this aspect to Leon. Thank you, Ulad, and thank you, uh, the person who posed the question. I think it's uh, very important to be aware of the different contexts in which we are dealing with memory memorialization and tr the operationalization of truth. Um, I want to focus to answer the question a little bit more on the Latin American experience, which I was discussing in the presentation, and it has to do with the right to truth or with the concept of the right to truth. There is no such thing as the right to truth in the relevant international legal instruments in the uh, Inter-American Convention of Human Rights or in the Declaration. But the courts, uh, the Inter-American Court has created a, uh, by virtue of interpreting the convention and by virtue of rights already in the convention, uh, developed a right to truth uh, or what it would amount to a right to truth with the progressive development of the jurisprudence. Now, this is uh, quite, it could be prejudicial to some extent to uh, be very cavalier and very forward looking uh, when states are not very happy with this approach. So there is that balancing act in this context, which needs to be taken taken into account. But the truth is, and just to use the word again, that social movements in Latin America have used the concept of truth in order to make claims to their governments um, related to the problem of enforced disappearances. If we think about Argentina, if we think about Chile and today about Mexico, uh, social movements have coalesced around the concept of truth and truth in many ways operationalizes not just this idea this uh, issue of enforced disappearances but also other kinds of um, human rights violations as well uh, operationalizes the right to to remedy of other human rights violations as well particularly when we have situations of uh, state failure or situations where the state is colluded with uh, non-state actors in order to create a situation which endangers uh, and puts uh, many lives at risk. So 
Truth has been a very malleable and useful concept to civil society, and the fact that we see it reflected in the court's jurisprudence is not a coincidence. So this is a very concrete example of how this Latin American context and the concept of truth in civil society is in dialogue with the jurisprudence of the um, Inter-American Court, despite the fact that we do not have explicit references to truth in the hard law positive legal instruments. Thank you. Thank you, Leon. And I will ask a final question to also to, to give the opportunity to Bernard to share some final reflections. Um, I think it's a, a question that's related uh, also to his uh, presentation. So uh, there is a question that, that is uh, posed by Chris Van Eyck, um, and uh, that is related to the issue of political will. Um, the person says, as we've seen in many states, it appears to be difficult to even merely define uh, the crime of enforced disappearance in domestic law. States less, like Spain, Chile, Peru, Sri Lanka, and Iraq continue to receive UNCAD critique. Um, and despite their obligations uh, of conduct to do so, uh, they still uh, don't apply uh, the ICCPD's definition, for example. So considering the state's definitional role in the crime and the importance of naming as a first step to truth telling and commemoration, the question is at what point does this lack of political will become an international law issue and what strategies uh, do you see to, to solve it? Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this uh, great question. Um, we try to uh, to push these governments in 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 the right direction uh, by formulating specific recommendations on legislative amendments. Uh, some governments uh, argue that the crime is already contained in their domestic legislation under other titles, such as the crime of kidnapping and so forth. And we reiterate um, the importance of uh, addressing it with its specific characteristics and uh, under the, the international human rights law definition. So we've, we've, uh, we've um, made uh, these uh, recommendations to, to many governments. Some have uh, adopted the definition uh, as provided under international law. So uh, after, uh, after we had made these recommendations to them. But of course, we continue to push for the adoption of such legislations. Uh, in particular, when we uh, when we uh, hold country visits and also uh, when we formulate broader recommendations in our annual reports each each year, but um, um, yes, it's it's it it it, it you know legislative uh, changes sometimes uh, uh, are, are 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 complex in terms of institutional change and, and, and the framework of adopting laws and so forth. But um, we believe that uh, notwithstanding uh, the specific um, particularities of each political context, in particular in post-transition contexts, all states have the obligation to uh, to adopt this, this, this type of legislation. Uh, in particular, of course, the states that have ratified the, the convention. Um, the issue of political will is always at the at the heart of uh, of uh, the challenges that we face um, when we negotiate. Uh, you know, uh, these types of changes with governments, in particular during country visits. Um, that's the often the the the. You know the the aspect that's most challenging because we need to work with uh, well-intentioned uh, civil servants and and political appointees uh, who uh, want to bring about change but face you know uh, uh, difficulties in 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 these very delicate contexts and uh, we s systematically try to uh, provide all the support that we can do in particular in terms of uh, technical assistance we've done so with many countries mexico chile and now we're working with other countries that want to address these issues uh, in their legislation so that um, all the technical hurdles are taken out of the way and 
you know it you know political will eventually has to uh, to uh, to to fall in uh, and 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 cannot rely on the technical uh, obstacles that uh, that no longer exist because uh, we try to, to to provide help on that level um so 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 these are these are challenges but they're not insurmountable uh, challenges i think uh, linked to political will um is also an issue of uh, demystifying what disappearances are and how important they are to transitional, how important it is to address this issue in transitional pro processes. When uh, my colleague is, who formed the delegation of the working group went to Albania not so long ago, they had very constructive discussions with civil servants and civil society organizations which addressed issues of past human rights violations in the context of the previous regime. Um, and most of the people have not framed um, the problem as one of enforced disappearances. So talking with them and addressing this from the enforced disappearance perspective, people who have disappeared in camps, people who have been captured in, in pseudo poly uh, you know, criminal processes and so forth, we were able to uh, push in the right direction for uh, not only legislative changes, but also institutional changes, creation of, inst of, of, of institutions that would address these issues, issues and support uh, both state and civil society initiatives related to memory, preservation of archives, creation of sites of memory and so forth, integrating the um, the uh, enforced disappearance uh, aspect. So by educating and, 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 you know, demystifying the concept, it has a real impact and allows for uh, uh, people who have tough decisions to make to uh, address them with more uh, transparency. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to ask all questions, but uh, attendees should uh, really uh, not hesitate to send their remaining questions. Just make sure you specify to which panel member you would like to address the question and send it uh, to, to the email address uh, through which you receive the invitation and the re registration uh, link. Uh, I would like to address heartfelt thanks uh, to Verley Beckett and Ellen Dorst, uh, uh, who are organized this event at ASER. Uh, and uh, we would like uh, again to renew our thanks to uh, Gabriela Guzman from the Secretariat of the UN Working Group. And uh, uh, last but not least, uh, heartfelt thanks to all the panelists for, for the great, uh, fruitful discussions that we had uh, today. Uh, have a lovely evening, everyone, and bye-bye. Uh, Stay tuned for the next events at the ESSER Institute. Thank you. Thank you.